It's one of the reasons, if, if you find yourself fascinated by this particular subject, by the criminal law, by federal criminal law, you got to law school and you thought, oh my God, I would never be interested in the criminal law. I'm going to make money, I'm going to be a transactional lawyer, I'm going to do X, I'm going to do Y, I'm going to do Z. And you saw yourself in that position. And yet you find yourself almost uh, inexplicably drawn to this stuff. It's because it's where the character of the human being really becomes interesting. Everything is a moral play. Everything has, um, has consequences. And, there's, and each and every day, each person involved in the process makes a decision that kind of defines who they are as a human being. And so they're walking on the edge of disaster or on the edge of sainthood or somewhere in between every single day. And the law that we create or that we apply literally manufactures that world anew. And, and that, to a certain type of person, is fascinating. And, and you get hooked on it, you can't get away from it. And then you have to try to explain to your mom and dad why you want to, why you want to represent criminals or why you want to do this sort of thing. It's almost like um, when it first happens, it's almost like a religious experience for a lot of people. Every semester I have someone come into my office and go, Professor Rose, I hate the criminal law, but I can't get away from it. That's why I think it's happening. What we're dealing with here, we're dealing with how much power should we give the police? How much unfettered discretion do we give the police to be capable of intervening into the lives of our citizens? And Draper seemed to say, you know, the cops got to get the information, verify it, and then they can go forward. Well, what does Aguilar Spinelli say? What does this case say? Somebody bring me back to the case and tell me at least what the holding was. And this, and this case, by the way, although it is no longer controlling federal law, is often still applied in many state jurisdictions. And the reason that it's still applied in many state jurisdictions is it has some things about it that are relatively uh, attractive. One of them is it is definable, right? I can apply it. I know what it is. It's, it's more of a bright line test. I've got the two categories, known and unknown informants. It's almost like a checklist. I can go through it. I can lay things out, and then I know whether or not I have probable cause. And I can look at it on a case-by-case -case basis and make a... a um, a determination. It also limits the power of the police arguably more than the Gates case does. And if you live in a state where you are concerned with the authority of the police, you might, as a, as a matter of state law, have a more restrictive constitutional standard. So if I, let, let's see, if, I, if I've got a known informant who has provided credible information in the past, so th this informant is, is a known quantity, and their, and their reliability has been great. And then they give me information in a particular set of circumstances, and not all of it's right, but some of it's right. I, I could bring these two together, the, the huge reliability of this informant in the past and the sort of reliability of the information this time, put them together, and that would be good enough for probable cause. Okay. On the other hand, I could have an anonymous informant, who I, who I have no knowledge of whether or not they're reliable. But I go and look at the specificity and the veracity of what they've told me. And if I put those two factors together, I can still get probable cause. So the, the, it's like I've got a bucket that has to be filled to uh, half a gallon. And as long as some of the water comes from the informant and some of the water comes from the veracity of the information, if I get a half a gallon's worth of water in my bucket, I've got probable cause. Is that everybody else's understanding of Aguilar Spinelli? Does that work? Well, even with totality of circumstances, what a lot of police departments do is they create procedures anyway. And they look, um, it's one of the reasons that the Aguilar Spinelli test is still so often used in many state jurisdictions is because it does give guidance to police. Uh, and if you'll, you'll think when we, when was Aguilar Spinelli decided? What was the date on it? 69? 69. When was Miranda decided? I think you'll find it's around the same time frame. 
Uh, Aguilar Spinelli comes from a time in the Supreme Court when the Supreme Court was concerned with uh, making certain that law enforcement could do its job, but not in allowing law enforcement to have too much power. So they're trying to balance these competing interests, and they're trying to give guidance to the court. And it's also during a time historically where there was some concern. 1969 was a relatively tumultuous time in the history of the United States. You know, from a civil rights perspective, from an anti-war demonstration perspective, um, it was a difficult time. I was all of eight years old and used to complain because the only thing that was on TV was the Vietnam War. But the generation right ahead of me, it, it was the seminal moment in their lives. You have this competing interest between security and freedom, very, very much so. And that court was trying to wrestle with it. What do you think about the test that they've created? Vicky's laid out at least one argument for its validity or for its helpfulness in that it um, at least gives guidance to the cops. Is anybody bothered by it? It's like shooting fish in a barrel. All right, we were talking about Illinois v. Gates when I left you uh, last time, and we're going to talk about Rand and Atwater today, but I want to go back over Gates for just a moment to make sure that we're all on the same sheet of music. Uh, this is, of course, a drug case, right? Now, the test was totality of the circumstances, right? What Gates did that was interesting was that it, it got Spinelli out of the federal courts. It also pretty much killed the ability to get um, the exclusion or the admittance of an informant's testimony at the trial level overturned at the appellate level. Because the totality of the circumstances is a test that is normally reviewed for an abuse of discretion standard. So it meant that the appellate courts could look at uh, these issues when they were raised at the appellate level and say, no, the trial, we're not going to uh, find that the trial judge abused their discretion. Now that's interesting for a moment because what it does is, is it applies a, um, how can I put this the right way? It sort of engineers a totality of the circumstances test and abuse of discretion onto the back of a constitutional right. Now, if you're a practical person working in the courts and you're inundated with these sorts of cases, you would, you would love this particular holding. If, on the other hand, you're a civil rights advocate or a criminal defense lawyer, you would not be very happy with it. And what's interesting to see is that while this has, uh, is the law in the federal bar, many state courts have continued to apply Aguilar Spinelli because each state jurisdiction uh, has the ability to determine beyond the floor of the Constitution how much procedural rights we're going to provide to our citizens. Uh, Y'all live in a state that happens to uh, have a very strong criminal defense bar as evidenced by the fact that you are even allowed to take depositions in criminal cases. Do you know how odd that is in comparison to the rest of the United States? The vast majority of states do not allow for depositions practice in criminal cases. And that's had some interesting implications in the state of Florida from other perspectives as well. And if you were in my trial ad class or my evidence class, you heard me talk about them. But uh, I can't talk about it here because it's not what you paid for. Now, he just killed suppression of, of, of informants. You need a gross error now on the part of the cop and relying upon the informant before you're going to get that case overturned. When was Gates decided? 83. 83. Is there another informant case that's gone up to the Supreme Court that I, that I put into the book? No. If... Um, if we presume for a moment that I and my research assistants were, were competent when we pulled these cases, that may very well be because this case took out informants as a constitutional issue at the appellate level. I think that that, that might be a slight overstatement of the impact of Gates, but it's not a really large overstatement of the impact of Gates. Why is it important for you uh, in the short term? Because in the short term, when I give you the essay exam and when I lay out 
Uh, you know, there's going to be a confidential informant of some kind in it somewhere because this is one of the key issues from a law enforcement perspective. Well, I'm going to expect you to be able to apply the Spinelli test and the Gates test and tell me if we're in a jurisdiction that follows one, will that have a different outcome than if we were in the jurisdiction that follows the other? The reason that I do that is twofold. Number one is because I want to make certain that you understand both tests. And I want to make certain that you see the implications depending upon which test is followed. Because that might even have, that, even, that might even at some point in your life when you're sitting in a federal courthouse and have the choice, maybe you're the decision maker between going the state route or the federal route for a prosecution, that might be a, a helpful piece of information. Uh, and it's one of those vagaries of the law where there's a difference in between jurisdictions. So whenever we have a crack in the law, that's always a good place uh, to test student knowledge. I just tell you up front, you'll see it again.